Um, I think it's time to start. Maybe some uh, Spanish people will get a little bit late, but um, I have to deal with that. Uh, my name is Anna, and I'm the scientific coordinator of the Spanish Embassy. And uh, I would just like to say hello to everybody and welcome to the Spanish Embassy. And uh, then I give the floor to Susana to introduce our uh, speaker tonight. It's a very uh, big pleasure. She is the uh, uh, coordinator of education and outreach in the Science Association, the Scientific uh, Science Association in the USA. Um, and they are doing a lot of things with us, and uh, we are so proud of that, and hope you will uh, enjoy it today, and hope you have a lot of questions afterwards. Okay? Susanna just left. <laughs> 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 and also, Iñaki, te va a tocar. Oh, I was very well pleased. She's coming back. I forgot my teaching. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, my name is Susana Marquez, and other introduced me. I'm a coordinator of the Education and Outreach Program of the Spanish scientists in the US, and in the name of the president in the Bar. Yeah, and other members of the board are going to go to this event. I'm going to speak very, very briefly about the USA. The USA started in Turkey, in this same group, about a year ago, with a small group of scientists. And since that, we have grown a lot. We already have 365 members. One member per year, we start exactly last March in 2014. We already have two chapters, one in Boston, one in New York. And the most recent in Washington DC. Uh, the Washington DC chapter started very recently. We have the members of the chapter here. The president is Anna Munoz. And I would encourage anybody that is interested in joining the USA DC to talk to another staff. USA has three objectives, three objectives. One of them is part of the outreach program and include to bring the science to the public. And this series of seminars that we are organizing here is part of that part of the program. The other project is one is networking, provide opportunities for communication and meeting Spanish scientists in here. And the other also is provide the welcoming to newcomers. And the other objective is another world is establish interaction with institutions in here in the US and also in Spain, or public and private. Um, part of this program of education outreach, we have started a series of seminars um, in 2015 in our three chapters in Boston, in New York, and Washington. Um, in Washington, this is our third talk. Uh, these seminars are sponsored by the Foundation Ramona Vertes, the private foundation in Spain. And also have the Spanish Foundation of Science, Science and Technology that Anna is uh, member here in the, in the embassy. Uh, so these are provided with the Spanish <coughs> of the seminars. Here is the list of seminars that we have for the spring series. Today we have Carmen Reina, and then we have three more for uh, April, May, and June. And in the fall, we have more seminars that we have in the the stocks. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Carmen Andrena. Um, Carmen is the senior scientist with the Global Marine Team at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, she holds degrees in zoology and conservation biology from the University of Complutense in Madrid and the University of Maryland. Uh, she has been involved in multiple global assessments, including the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the World Water Development. Um, she has published numerous publications, has been part of the publication that was the basis for the TBS species series on other fishing. Um, with that, I want to welcome partner and the call of her seminar here, yeah. working with you. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome everybody to the Christmas Parade for the Spanish I'm Spanish, and I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to thank the Embassy and Ecusa 
um, for inviting me. I just heard about it from someone because I knew but I'm really impressed there. It means a lot. It's really great to have my network of scientists in Spain. And I'm discovering we have all kinds of contacts at the, at the embassy that are also very involved in fisheries and agriculture. So this is great. So usually when um, <coughs> you come to listen to someone that works on the oceans, they always say they grew up next to the ocean and they spent their summers snorkeling with their parents. Well, I grew up in Madrid, which is probably the furthest you can get from the ocean today. My parents hated the beach, so we never went to the beach. Instead, we spent all our holidays in that. But my father is an avid angler, he likes to fly fish for trout. And he went to all the you know little rivers around Madrid and in the north and tried for me to get to fish. And I am probably the worst fisher woman on the planet. I am not good at it, I never caught anything. So I spent a lot of time, a lot of weekends, just sitting by the river watching my father fish, which is as exciting as watching golf on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so all I had was books and the books that I had were my father's fishing guys. And I really got very interested in how many types of fish there are. And then I grew up with an American mother and grew up with Dr. Seuss, who also has a thing for fish. So I blame Dr. Seuss for my interest in fish. Um, so I continued my career in biology and conservation. Um, and I ended up, I had a nice picture of a fish because, you know, they are cute. I mean, they may not look cute, but they are cute. So that's another reason. And I ended up at the Nature Conservancy, and some of you I know here, because I've seen there are some colleagues here from, from some of CNC and some from other years. But for those who don't know, the Nature Conservancy is one of the largest conservation organizations. Um, our mission is to conserve the lands and waters of the John Mark Defense. And we were founded in 1951 in the state of New York. We started as a land trust, so buying land and setting it aside for conservation. We have about 3,500 employees, 600 of them are scientists. We are known to be a science-based organization. We're in 35 countries and in all 50 states of the U.S. Uh, we have about a million members, uh, and then we saved a lot of the trees and miles of rivers. And currently, we have about 200 marine-related projects around the world. So I'm going to focus just on fish, the country that's <laughs> Um and in addition of fish being really cute and tasty, they are fisheries are really important for, for humans. So about 70% of 17% of the world depends on fisheries as the primary source of animal protein. There are also many people that depend on fisheries and agriculture for jobs. It's around, I mean, their numbers are not exact, but they're they also cite site about 500 million jobs. And in addition, it's one of the most um, traded food commodities. Um, it generates about $130 billion a year in trade, and more than 50% of this comes from developing countries. And just to give you an example, because I'm always amazed at the statistic that 90% of the seafood we eat in the U.S. is imported from somewhere else. And that's something that most consumers, I don't think, think about. So, the problem with today's way that we fish is that we're just really, really good at catching. So good at it that 85% of the stocks are either depleted, overfished, or being fished at their biological limit, which means that if you put more pressure on them, they can also be overfished. Uh, and these statistics, even though they're kind of sobering, really only refer to those fish stocks and those fisheries that we actually regularly assess, which is about 400 stocks around the world, and there are about 10,000 fisheries. All the other fisheries, we really don't monitor them and we don't really have a good sense of how they're doing. But there's a, a paper from some of the leading scientists in this area from the University of Santa Barbara. And they have shown, looking at tax statistics, that, that even these ANSS fisheries, the ones that we don't know much about, are in really um, declining condition. And this is a graph of those kinds of fisheries. So you have the large scale fisheries, which are not doing that badly, but they're still in decline. And then the ones that are in real trouble are the small scale around the world. And the Nature Conservancy does work in both, but we're paying a lot of attention to the 
the NSS small scale business issues. This also is where most of the people um, have jobs or professional. For those in the room, a lot of in the room know this by heart. <laughs> but for those of you in the room that don't know how, how did we end up in this messy situation with fisheries, is that most of the fisheries in the world are still managed under what we call the open access system, basically, with very little control and regulation. So the incentive is to raise, to raise, um, to catch fish because if you, if you have short time to catch fish, you try and go out and catch as much fish as you can, as fast as you can, so that you don't catch somebody else will. So that's one of the largest problems with enforcement. There's too many boats. The picture up there is in, in China and the East China Sea. This is the first day that the China Sea has been fishing again, and as you can see, it's a massive amount of boats. Um, we could catch the same amount of fish we catch today with 50% less of the boats we have. So it's, it's not a very efficient use of our fleet. Uh, the industry together loses about $50 billion a year to this management. In most of the countries, and the fisheries departments just don't have the resources to really assess and manage and enforce the law. So it's part of it is that it's at the same time, we waste a lot of fish um, and we do a lot of damage to habitats, which also impacts fishery production. Um, one of these impacts is the bycatch and what we call bycatch and discards. Bycatch is the, the things you catch that you're not intending to catch, but you catch anyway. And this affects a lot of species like sea turtles and seabirds or some marine mammals. And discards are things that, sorry about the timing, <laughs> are things that you catch, you're not intended to catch either, and you can either not keep or you're not going to use. So that just gets thrown back in the ocean, so it's kind of wasteful. And also, we do that a lot with sharks. You cut the fins off and then just throw the carcass back in the ocean. In terms of how we fish, we've been in the northern hemisphere on fishing methods that are quite destructive. They're very technical fishing methods. So bottom trawling is an example. There are large nets that get dragged at the bottom of the sea and they're very effective. They catch everything that pass. So down below, this one is without a trawl pass and then that's what's left after the trawl has gone by. And as you can see, it pretty much sucks everything up. But it's not a very selective way of fishing. So you catch a lot of stuff that you really don't need that ends up being tossed back in the ocean. In the developing world, uh, the most useful, the one that they use the most are gill nets, and it's the same thing. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to use, it's cheap, you can deploy it at any time, it's very effective, it catches a lot of stuff, but again, it's not very selective. So, you catch a lot of uh, juvenile fish that haven't had time to reproduce. So, all these things combined make the situation in our fisheries to be on a declining trend. But it's not all that depressing. So, at the Nature Conservancy, of course, we want to fix the problem, and we want more fish, we want healthy oceans, we would like fishermen to continue having jobs and keeping their jobs in local communities, and we also want sustainable supply of sea. Um, our focus is on the supply side. There are a lot of groups that have worked a lot on creating the demand, so a lot of groups have worked with Whole Foods and Costco and all these supermarkets to really <coughs> demand sustainable sourcing of seafood. And that's been very, um, very good, but there's not enough supply. And the Nature Conservancy really is good at working on the ground with fishermen. So we are kind of focusing on, on helping create that supply and helping move these fisheries that are data poor, that are open access to some sort of regulated system, to be rights-based on it or another similar. And we do this a lot by partnering with fishermen and the private sector. We also work with governments, but they're a little slow. A government that we are. So where we're working now, uh, we're focusing on the five, top, one, five of the top fishing nations, the United States, uh, Indonesia, China, Peru, and Chile. But we also focus on a lot of smaller countries and small island states where fisheries are very important for the livelihood. So in Micronesia, Laos, federal, federal states of Micronesia and Marshall Islands, 
um, Asia, South of the Union, Solomon Islands, Kenya, and, and the Caribbean and the East, Bahamas, and the <laughs> So that's sort of where the fishery, the PNC works with many countries, but this is where the fisheries group is focusing on. And how we work, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to walk you through a couple of projects that will make more sense, but we have this five prong approach. Um, in all of the places where we work are the main partners of the fishermen. They're the ones out there fishing every day. They're the ones that have to change the fish. So we have to involve them and, and help them lead reforms. We're focusing again on these group of fisheries that are unassessed and trying to find ways that you could assess them at a lower cost so people can do it with not fancy research vessels, a lot of money, and a lot of capacity. We work with governments because we do need a policy framework. Uh, uh, we're focusing a lot on new technology and trying to use technology and changes in technology to advance and, and fishery management. And finally, we're working with the buyers, the distributors, and the processors that work up front in the supply chain to also help these small scale fisheries access the market and get a little bit more income from the products and the information better. So, I'm going to focus on Three projects, uh, one in Palau, one in Indonesia, that revolve around assessing the condition of fish stocks and where they're working to get data for fishery. And then I'll talk about one in Palau. <coughs> so, on these fisheries, about 80% of the world's catch comes from these fisheries that we know very little about. And if you don't know how much fish there are, and you don't know how much pressure they're under, or how much capacity that stock has to recover, it's very hard to manage it. Basically, something doesn't get measured usually goes unmanaged. But the traditional way that stock assessments are done are very costly. They're hundred thousand, two million dollars, they require a research vessel, they require a lot of data, and they require a lot of scientists to do the work. In most of the developing world, and including a lot of the states and that don't have those resources and that capacity. So it has to be another way. And we believe that you can find um, cheaper methods that can use cash data to assess the stock so that you can set management measures that are realistic. Even though they might never be as fancy as a real stock assessment, but they're, they're some people start with. And we tend to engage fishermen and, and processors in this data collection so that they start seeing the data for themselves. And once they are the ones collecting the data, they tend to believe it more. So in Palau, and for those of you who don't know where Palau is, Palau is a small island state in the Western Pacific. It's to the west of the Philippines, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's formed by about 250 volcanic islands, and it has a population, so it's not a huge country. Uh, but it's a country that really depends on the beauty of their Coral and their ocean resources. They early on they had a, a government and a president that have been very committed to the environment. And so up to 40% of their Palawan waters are under a marine protection area type of um, regulation. So in theory, their waters should be um, doing quite well, their fishery should be doing quite well. But the population of Palau, the people we talk to, the fishermen, I could say actually no. Every time we go out, there's fewer and fewer fish. Um, but of course, it's never their fault, right? It's always Latinos are coming in and we go researching, or Indonesians are coming, or you know, that tourism hotel and they're discharging. So it was never their fault. So we started a program with the fishermen in the northern region, the region of Palau, to collect data on, on the fish they're catching. And they taught them how to measure the fish, the length, and how to look at the reproductive organs of the fish to see if they were short fish and juvenile fish. Um, so we did this with a few of the top species that these uh, flowers depend on. And we found that 60% of the fish are catching are juvenile fish. So they realized, hmm, now maybe we do have something to do with it after all. And it was amazing because after we presented the findings, they were they stopped questioning whose fault it was. They said, let's do something about it. Uh, and so it was a very effective way to get them to really get engaged and really come up with measures that can work. So now we're working with the same fishermen to come up with different 
area closures and fishing bans and different management measures to recover these stocks. So that's what you can do in a small space like Palau. The other case is in Indonesia, in the country, that's married to people or in the South Island. Um, big fisheries, obviously we're not gonna get all the fishing together and start catching fish by hand. So we started working on a fishery, it's the deep water sector fishery. It um, takes place in the border between Australia and Indonesia, where Timor Leste is, on that area. It's not our near shore fishery, it's a deep water fishery. And when we started working with this fishery, they told us they were around 30 species that they caught. Um, we didn't really know much about it, um, we or the processor of the buyers. Well, we partnered with two companies. One is Norpac Fishing Export. This is a North American company and a joint venture with a Chinese company called uh, Lunghai Fishing Venture. And they buy uh, fish in Indonesia and they export it to the US. And then we also partnered with a processor who processes the fish to Norpac there. And um, that's their plant is called PT Pretty Morning uh, And we were trying to find ways in which we could. Um, Work with and start collecting data to figure out <coughs> what is the condition of these, these fisheries in the stock. I'm going to show you some photos for you to get a sense of the fishery and the size. So, this is a, a mid scale fishery. These are the boats. Um, this is the bring the boats. I don't know why they put them in plastic bags, but they wrap it, each fish in a plastic bag and then they get reported and they throw the bags in the ocean. So, now we have a recycling program to get them not to throw the bags in the ocean. <laughs> So they're a little bit so uh, they're in the hold or in ice, and then they get downloaded. Yeah, they get landed here on the port, which is the great thing is to get more of that. Um, and, and then inside the fishing plant, they, they start sorting out the fish by species, and they start cleaning the fish and grading the fish and processing the fish. And so once we started working with uh, this company, we, we were told there were about 30 species. And so we a bunch of scientists would be starting samplings and turns out there are more than 100 species of fish and then we were selling a lot of snapper that is not really snapper. Um, we've also been using um, electronic tracking devices. We use a thing called spot tracer. It's really an anti-step device. It's not really meant to track those but to track anything you don't want to steal it. And it's actually quite cheap and we can put it in boats and the captains actually don't mind having it because Captains have crew and they want to know if their crew are fishing, so they were delighted to have spot tracers in the boat. <laughs> the crew is not that happy, but um, so we got a sense of where they're going, who's fishing in that water, uh, and then we developed a fishing guide. Going back to all about that idea, it's just that thing there of each species uh, with all their information, and each species has a barcode system. That then the fishermen, the processing plant employees can scan. We've, worked, we've trained the plant employees on fish identification and the scanning methods, and then we're, we've built a computer system that can start processing data automatically so we can start collecting it to do stock assessment. And in order to measure the fish fast, when you're processing a lot of fish that spoils, it has to be a system that doesn't delay processing, that is not complicated, and that can really be accurate. So we invented a machine, and I'm going to show you a little video because it's hard to explain, that allows you to measure the fish that are coming in the processing plant. So here's the video, let me see if it works. So you're going to see they're going to, uh, basically what happens is the fish are landed, they're sorted and graded in boxes, and then each box um, gets scanned. So she gives her this, the scan, she scans the, the box, and so all these fish are the same species, and then they start measuring the fish. And so it's a scanner and a measuring board. You take the scanner, you measure the length of the fish, and it gets reported automatically into the computer. And they're doing that really slow. In reality, they're five fish at a time, and they go really fast. <coughs> but we've done tests, and it's actually quite accurate. So we only are off by like three centimeters. So what we can do with this data is we start seeing where is most of your fish 
where does it fall? Each species has a, a length, a maturity, and an optimal length. And so if you start seeing that all your fish are down this side of the curve, all your fish are juvenile. So you're obviously overfishing your stock. Instead, if you're fishing and all your fish are mature in the right length, you're probably fishing your stock okay. So this is what this is allowing us to do. And this also goes to the processor and to the exporter because Norpac is an exporting company that has commitments with US supermarkets that are committed to uh, sustainable sourcing. They have to show that they're fishing sustainably. So this is helping them do that. And then all this information gets into the phase and they go with the label. And so eventually you will be able to track and, and as a consumer, you'll be able to see, oh, okay, well, this case is really unique. Yeah, this case is like this company, this snapper, and that's the goal to get there. Um, so that's that's in the meeting. <laughs> and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about a different type of project that we've been engaged in for the past 10 years in one of our oldest fisheries projects. Which is a little bit different. It's not necessarily about assessing the stock and trying to find out what's going on. Um, this is in the West Coast in California, in the West Coast Groundfish Fishery. This is a fishery that goes up and down the West Coast of the U.S. Uh, it's about 80 species in this fishery, all of them bottom-loading species, and it's a mix. There's some flatfish, a lot of rock fish, and there's black cod or sable fish. Um, gets caught together. Get caught together. And the main fishing uh, gear is a trawl, it's a bottom trawl. So, this fishery was very profitable in the 80s and 90s, uh, and then it started collapsing. A lot of the habitat was destroyed because of the trawlers. Uh, a lot of the rockfish started declining. And the US government, federal and federal land species, started putting in regulations. It became a lot of burden and regulation, very costly to the fishermen. And then in 2000, it was declared a federal fishery disaster. And it was pretty much a lot of the processors closed up and left. And a lot of the fishermen were pretty desperate. And they, you know, they're stuck with a trawler, you can't sell it, you can't catch fish, it's expensive. Um, so when we then was in around 2000, and we started working with the fishermen and with other groups and the regulatory agencies to try and this and set aside some areas for no troll zones, so areas where you couldn't troll. Um, and it, this was a process, and we ended up petitioning the Pacific Council for a set aside of 3.8 million acres of no troll zones. And some of the fishermen who helped us throughout this process said, you know, that's fine, but you're putting us out of the <coughs> And so the nature conservancy said, fine, we'll buy you out, and we'll buy your permits. And you don't lose that to get some money and so some of them said yes and we ended up buying not all of them at once but we ended up buying 13 permits out of 23 permits so we ended up being one a very large asset holder in this fishery and as a as an ngo we don't tend to have a seat at the table with the fishermen so now we work and I, th I think the belief by the fishermen and by many was that we would shell the permits but we felt that we're asking fishermen to change their practices and demonstrate that they can fish sustainably and make a living. We should demonstrate that it can be done. So we said to change the business model in that fishery. Um, so the old business model was it was a high volume fishery with low value. You know, you troll fish for four hours in the net. It's not very good place come out of it. And we wanted to change it to a vol low volume low volume high value fishery with certain conservation restrictions on how the fishing takes place. In 2011, uh, the West Coast Roundfish Fishery switched to a cashier system. And for those who don't know a cashier system, it's a regular type of system where each fisherman has a quota allocated to them based on their catch history. And so the fishermen don't have to raise for fish, right? It's a much better way. And, um, and so what happened is there are some species, um, like the silver sole, where it is very abundant. So you get tend to get a, a large quota for that. 
But there are other species like the yellow eye rockfish, which are not very abundant. And so the quota is very limited. So here's the total level catch for <coughs> the, rock, uh, the yellow eye rockfish, and it's only 1,300 pounds for the fishery. Whereas it's, you know, 49 million pounds for this over So in 2011, if you're a fisherman and you have very little rock eye, yellow uh, rock eye fish, <laughs> yellow eye rockfish, yellow eye rockfish, canary rockfish, um, it's very risky to go fishing. Because if you go fishing and you put down a toe, Pull it up, and suddenly you had two kilos of quota, and you have four kilos of rockfish. To land the, the foot the fish, you have to buy quota, and nobody wants to sell you their quota because they're so limited. And if you don't have quota, you can't land your fish, and then you're closer to business. So it's a very risky thing to go fishing for that. So when it first started, it was, I think, for a few months, nobody went fishing. Everybody was waiting, um, <laughs> and. With the Nature's Conservancy permits, we also got a pretty big allocation of overfish species quota. And I think it was just coincidence that we bought the permit that had a lot of that quota. So we became um, pretty wealthy in quota for overfish species, and we were trying to find a way to reduce risk to fishermen, including ourselves. And, and we created, and we copied this from the insurance company. So, we figured out we'll pull all our quota together and invite fishermen to join the the risk pool. And if you're one in our risk pool and you go out and have a bad day, you can take quota from the pool to cover your landings. Um, but you do have to fish by our rules. And our rules are to have spatial fisheries management plans, observers on board, um, gear switching and zoning restrictions, and also we developed an app called eCatch that allows you to track everything you're doing on an iPad. And this was fun because when we first did this, and we gave iPad to the fishermen, you should have seen their looks. They were like, what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> and we were convinced they were gonna throw the iPads and work <laughs> They came back the next day, they had to throw it over the like, yes. And then after a while, they're like, you know, it's actually useful. And so I, one of the fishermen that worked with us, he was at a presentation recently and he said, Carmen, I don't go fishing anymore. I go out and collect data. It's a total transformation. So what they discovered is, um, so the idea is we have these fishing associations that we help and, and they form and they, they're all part of the risk pool. And they don't fish together and compare the data. So we have these fishing, spatial fishing management plans. And so if one of them goes out and puts down a um, hook and line and gets a lot of rockfish, immediately it sends a notice to the other saying, hey, this is a bad area, and avoid this area. And so there's, they've discovered that collectively and sharing information with some fishing company, they can fish better. They can find places they want to set aside the control zones. They can also you know, save on gas and things like that. So it's been a very, very um, successful model that is also being replicated in other parts of the coast. Uh, and also it's helped them demonstrate that they are fishing very sustainably. Um, they would like to get a market access for that and really get more price for the fish and, and special uh, access to special markets that right now they don't have. Uh, so for them it's really worked. It's, 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 the value of these permits has increased. And just to show you the difference on, on the quota used is the risk pool is only using 2% of the available quota, whereas the rest of the fleet is using 35% for these overfish species. So it really shows that you can really manage it well and avoid a lot of these overfish species. Um, so this has been a very successful project. Right now we're working with the community, um, community organizations to try and figure out how to market their fish that they have a uh, financial input in place. Um, and we gave all our data and the fishermen's data to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a seafood watch card. And the West Coast brown fish fishery appears as red. And when they did the analysis with the data and our risk pool, it was green. And so now we're trying to work with them, with the fishermen, to see if you know, 
they should be some reward for them doing the right thing, and they should be able to get into the better market and get them um, better prices for their place. So, so this is a, a very fun and long uh, project, but it's been very successful in doing similar things also in Spain and also in Maine. Um, and that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Or, or try to be, you know, that's not something that's expensive. Like, 
it's not an adult. I'm wondering how, what the experience has been with the second part of the low volume, high value equation, with the with the getting better value for the for the larger uh, sizes and in these three fisheries or in any other. Yeah, they were getting much better value. So the the black cod, which is the one they fish the most, less boring, whatever two dollars a pound, all this one something a pound. You get you get a really long thing to lay to the hook and line because you want getting to the trawl. I think the the challenge is the you know fish prices are fluctuate a lot depending on the land you live in or how you get supported from other countries. So what the fishermen are now concerned about is that they really need that market access edge. They 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 don't want to be labeled as a boy because the whole West Coast round is they can show their green, they can show their green spatial. So if they could get, you know, guaranteed access to certain market, not as much the price premium as that market access and maintaining market presence that is almost more value. So their perception was that the sustainability was having uh, an impact on market on, on market access more so than the size. Yeah, yeah, no, the, and definitely in the US and Europe, other places than China now. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S. and Europe, market access and sustaining that market um, or your fishery over your products is very important uh, because mm -hmm. more and more commitments are being made to sustainable sourcing, and so it's almost hard to get into Costco or Whole Foods or anywhere else and then you can show it. And so the fishermen that work with us in risk will really show it in spatial data and maps. But they're frustrated <coughs> is that just because they're not in the sea doesn't mean you can't show it. So the alternative is this fish improvement project or on a great day aquarium. So finding those other avenues that you don't have to go through the whole certification marine stewardship council, which is very expensive. And our fishermen would never be able to qualify for the stewardship council because that's the entire fishery that would be equipped to fish, and it's not. So that that those are part of the challenges that we are managing these huge areas as a single fishery when I'm sorry, I was late, so I don't know if you can touch the area of European cost as well as, you know, the Atlantic Ocean and North Sea and so on. And the other question is what the TNC represents. Is that a federal or government sponsor or is a private company? The Nature Conservancy is a non-governmental organization, so they're a conservation organization. Uh, we get most of our funding uh, some government but not much and industry but not much we do private donations. Um, we don't work in Europe. We don't have projects in Europe, we have offices in Europe that can do for policy and fishing, but um, my new my new boss is Maria de Manaki, who's <laughs> former EU fisheries commissioner, so I you know, I don't know. <laughs> my work in Europe next year. Um, so the Argentina has a very strong call in with the fisheries. They really have been doing a good job for at least 10 or 15 years. Some good, some not good, but at least they have their focus and the problem is so likely. But we don't, we don't have any field programs in Europe. Nice one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot about the Nature Conservancy. Um, I don't know if you can talk about the fisheries, what percentage of the fishers are in the risk pool and how does that level out or is it still an increase depending on what are you doing to get the rest of the It's been increasing. They're, they're not all in our risk pool, but there are some other similar risk pools that have been bringing up and down the coast. So right now, we are working with four different community fishing associations, what we're calling the community quota funds, because they come together and create their own organization. Um, but I know that up in Waco, Washington, some parts of Washington and Argo, there are others that have started something similar. Um, so. We hope that this can be replicated not by us, but just by fishermen. Um, and, it, and we do see a trend increase. I had a really simple question with the, the slide that you showed uh, on trap stocks and you defined those on trap stocks. Is that information based on? Yeah, it's, um, 
the paper that Christmas Fellowship has been in Santa Barbara, and it's all based on the combination of taxes and but it's the only information that they can see. But I think it's pretty good. They got quite a lot of pictures that they have not completely by the means of study. Is there a reason why that school was not selected as one of the site? No, our <coughs> mostly because we were looking at the top country, country countries and I think it's further down the list. But also because capacity was our program in Mexico doesn't have enough capacity. Um, so, and they're busy with other things. <laughs> but yes, so until we have things, we'll be Do you think you'll be entering other fisheries as permit holders or permit consolidators? Are there other fisheries that you're thinking of? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, we are, we do have a couple permits to go point. We are considering adding more permits in, in the Gulf of Maine, but the price of the permits are so high for what they can actually work. Uh, I think we're also looking at Massachusetts, which is a called the Brown Fish. Um, I don't think we'll be buying permits um, outside of the year, uh, but you never know. Uh, because, well, you know, they don't come with a quota allocation, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, it's expensive to do it that way. Um, so, we would rather find a way to submit it instead of not letting them out there. So, maybe not you necessarily, but the other groups in Mexico, in terms of involving the budget consideration problem. We, I think we were involved with the Pisa early on, but <coughs> not now. I think EDF. Scott used to run the Mexico program for EDF. He could probably tell you more about the Pisa than I can. <laughs> so you mentioned that um, a lot of the fishermen you're working with, uh, in order to get access to to better markets, they would need some sort of certification like MSC, but they can't because of the current standards they're required to meet at, as a fishery, at the fishery level. Um, and then you mentioned Monterey Bay. TNC has a lot of clout. Do you think TNC is well positioned to actually kind of, um, I guess, broker a sort of like other certification program through the MSC or something like that? Or do you think the best kind of uh, Path to access to better markets would be through Monterey Bay or some other certification program entirely. I think, I mean, we talked about it internally because we wanted to figure out how to accelerate the uh, path to certification for a lot of the small scale fisheries. Um, we don't see ourselves as often auditors or even certifiers, um, but we do, we, we are working with the Marine Fisheries Council to try and find a path for what they call fisheries in transition. So fisheries in the developing world that will never have a perfect stock assessment. So what are the vehicles and what are the benchmarking tools that they can use to get there? So we are working with them on that and providing them that list of tools. Um, we're also trying to work with what they're called the fishery improvement projects. There are a lot of fishery improvement projects out there. Some of them run by the one of them, some of them run by the fisheries partnership, some of them run by EDF, some of them run by TNC. And there's a whole range. Some of them are really good and some of them are just greenwashing. Some of them are on my industry as well. And so we are involved with quite a few of these fish improvement projects and I think the idea that this the, the retailers are now getting a little suspicious that some of the fish improvement projects that they're selling as simple source is not quite there. And the Marine Stewardship Council and of course the people that have gone through full certification are really annoyed that their market share is getting eaten by people who are just going to be So there is a talk between the FIPS and the NSC to try and find a common way to grade these fisheries improvement projects. And we're definitely helping on that as well, but I don't think we'll ever be the one to certify. Okay, right, else Fernandez.
any uh, various types of information you want to talk about the operation whether it's government or tech sector, we have the tools to be able to monitor the information. No, I, I, I have a pet peeve of mine with the IMD. <laughs> 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 the legal, unreported, unregulated decisions. Everybody's focusing on the I, but almost all the 10,000 decisions are unregulated, unreported, and they're still need a lot of for me, legal fishing has attracted a lot of attention in the country, especially tuna and high value commodities and for European, um, uh, you know, for entering the European market. All that is, is good, but I, I do find that, you know, regulating and removing these fisheries for more the rights space or access space or something is also needed. And that would go a long way to actually crack down on illegal fishing as well. Uh, in terms of technology, I know that there are two big technology things that have come up. I think it's um, Q and Google. No, Q and Skype have one where they can monitor large vessels from, from satellites. And I think that is a useful tool, but you still need someone interpreting those data. And then you still need a patrol boat to go and arrest them. And like Palau has one boat, and the entire country has one boat. So, you know, it's going to be hard. Um, and then Google and Jana also have another boat tracker satellite thing. So I think technology is coming and technology is going to be helpful. But I still think that we, all of us, need to invest in capacity in the country. So they can actually, you know, they have good laws and books, but they can't implement them. They don't have these things. So it's not, you know, technology can help, but definitely doesn't. You're having a summit in May. It's organizing a summit. I don't know. Yeah, we're trying to get uh, the new generation, the younger generation, very involved. Um, so we wanted to talk about the What about the old generation? Thank you. I feel like you're doing a lot of social information from the European to you see there's a beautiful publication every, I don't know, two months or three months with all the data and what they do and, and so on and so forth. And this is very effective in, in controlling the issue. Yeah. So go to Google, the field of the fishers. When you go through these three case studies, is there a, <laughs> um, when you go through these three case studies, can you find out, is there any way that you help Yes, a lot of our research is on, on near motivations for these bycatch, especially bycatch of juvenile fish. So in Maine, we do own permits, but we don't squeeze them to go fishing as much as we squeeze them to the fishermen, and they can fish, but they also test the new gear. So they're testing different size mesh nets of the juvenile pods, and we're sort of doing well. So trying to map where the spawning grounds for cod are. Are there and trying to look at the state out of that way. So, it, so, a lot of our work is goes into the research and alternative years. Um, so. Thank you so much.